I'm um, one of the service improvement facilitators at Pan Birmingham Cancer Network. Initially, um, or across the years, there have been two of us, myself and a colleague, who started all the work and then I've picked up halfway along. So what we were looking at um, is developing the breast one night stay model. Uh, for, for a short period of time, it was also known as the breast 23 hour uh, model that was uh, rolled out nationally. Um, they found that 23 hour was a bit ambiguous and it was very hard to audit when it came to looking at definite admission and discharge times. So we moved it to the one night stay model. So historically, we started in One Trust in 2006. Um, we were, or well, most of the networks were approached by NHS Improvement uh, to try and find a pilot site for this project. We took it to our network uh, breast site specific group and approached all of the breast consultants and clinical leads from across the network and asked for volunteers. Uh, we had a couple of trusts that shouted out saying they wanted to be involved and one stuck through it, uh, which was City Hospital at Samuel and West Birmingham. So for them, the majority of patients were admitted the day before surgery. Normally, uh, due to bed blocking, it was a shared surgical unit, and if you didn't have the beds, there was no beds for the patients to come back to for recovery. Uh, so historically, every consultant within the service admitted the day before. Discharge wasn't normally planned until, well, it wasn't normally planned, it, the consultant came around on ward rounds and said, patient's ready to go home. So there was no way to plan, there was no way to keep the patient informed and the patient's relatives informed of what was going to happen. Because it wasn't planned, they had to wait for analgesia. So even after the ward round and the consultant had said, you're free to go home, they then had to wait for the TTOs, wait for the discharge letters and all the rest of it. At the time, it was purely consultant-led. So there were three consultants on the breast service, and they were doing as well as they knew, and their follow-up patients in clinic, they also had the surgical unit. Morphine PCA pumps were used for the majority of patients, which meant that even if the patient was well enough to go home, they were suffering from all the side effects, groggy and sickness and all the rest of it. The majority of patients normally had two or three surgical brain, uh, drains, and they all expected a long length of stay. This group of patients, I forgot to mention, were the mastectomies, were the auxiliary node clearances, the wide local excisions. We stayed with the breast conserving surgery and mastectomies rather than touching on reconstruction work. The uh, main reason was purely because we wanted to deal with one, set, one team to start with, and if we went into the reconstructions, it would involve all the plastic surgeons as well, which at the time would have been a nightmare. So first steps, we did our current and future state mapping, as most people do. We looked at all the data analysis, looked at all the length of stay. We set up a project group involving not just the lead consultants, but the CNSs, the breast care nurses, nurses from the wards, healthcare assistants, pre-op nurses, um, and all the way along pharmacy. And we tried to find reasons why they were being admitted the night before and why there was no plan for this patient once they were admitted. We then also involved all of the managers to make sure that any changes that the consultants and the team suggested could were actually viable. And we created an action plan and followed the patients through. So we did the, the old chalk circle, followed several patients through each of the different routes. So each type of surgery, we followed those patients. And we followed quite a few just to see if it was a fluke or there was a hitch in the system that day or anything like that. And we also did um, some patient surveys. So most of our work, we tend to do a patient survey at the start so we can see what they're thinking and then we'll do one afterwards. With the mapping, we had a historic pathway and then the early discharge pathway. Although the steps were the same number of steps, they were reorganised to be in a better order and to be done by the most appropriate member of staff. We had senior nurses on the wards that were there with the patients, had the experience with the patients, 
and we didn't have to wait <coughs> for the routine patients, we didn't have to wait for consultants to say whether or not they could go home, because the ward rounds, as most people know, were meant to come round at nine o'clock and it can be any time. So although the, the steps are the same, or same number, they were better organised. We went through all of our waste reduction, so we looked at the pre-assessment clinics before they would come and see the consultant for results. They would come back again to see the pre-op. They would come back again to see the breast care nurse and to go through all the information prior to surgery. And we rolled that into one. And at first we did think, is this too much for the patients all in one day? So we sat down and spoke to some of them. And they actually preferred with the parking as it is at the majority of hospitals in our area, and I'm sure the majority of hospitals, <coughs> and the costs for parking and the disruption to their lives, they were happy to get it all over and done with because they knew that they had their pre-op assessment and a week later they'd be in surgery and it would be a weight off their mind to know that the cancer had gone from their body or to the chances of it going from their body. Um, we looked at a day of surgery admission policy once we found out it was purely bed blocking uh, and set up, do all patients need to come in first thing in the morning? Or can we try and stagger our admission so that the, the wards and the admission areas aren't getting 20-odd patients a day, 30-odd patients a day that all need to be clerked in? So we staggered it. We had a morning list, afternoon lists, and those and staggered it throughout the day so patients could come in and sit in comfort prior to a very anxious surgery. We also uh, looked at underutilisation. As I said, the nurses were superb. They had so much knowledge and so much experience. And we managed to convince the consultants to have standard operating procedures so that the majority of the patients that were straightforward surgeries would fit into the standard operating procedures and that they could, the nurses would then discharge following a checklist. Patients, I keep mentioning them, we spoke to the patients, we surveyed the patients. For me and for the team, the patients are at the heart of everything. Every day spent in hospital is a waste of a day. So after all the changes, 95% of patients were admitted on the day of surgery. There were some because not every patient fits the model. Some need the extra care prior to surgery or the extra test prior to surgery. Discharge were planned at the time of admission. Now they're planned at the pre-op assessment. So they're planned a week before admission. <coughs> discharge analgesia is now ready for discharge. We managed to speak to the consultants, find out through auditing on the wards what were the standard medications that patients were being given and develop TTO packs so that it was all held on the wards. So we didn't have to wait for a prescription to reach pharmacy at the other end of the building and wait for it, all the drugs to come back or send the patient up to collect them. As I mentioned, we went on to nurse their discharge. Post-surgery, because they uh, infiltrate the wound, they, that then means that the patients do not need to have the PCA pumps. They can now have, the majority will just have oral analgesia. And all the consultants have reduced the use of drains and 50% of consultants no longer do use drains. The 50% that do, they ended up with another patient, another consultant, for, so they now have four. So the two that do use drains have reduced it down to one, and have also reduced the length of time the drain is in. Before, the drain used to be in for five days, and they had to be discharging less than a certain amount for it to be removed, and the patients had to go home, and we had to liaise with all the outreach. Now, because they're not using them for as long a period, then we don't have to do all of that. It's, the patient doesn't have to carry a drain bottle around with them at home. It, that bit took a lot, a lot of work to do. Um, there was lots of audits into whether seromas could be formed and all the rest of it. And look, I mean, over the years, we've looked at cosmetic effects of the drains as well, just purely because the consultants loved the evidence base and would only act on evidence based and audit. So now, with this unit, we have at the, a couple of years ago, they were on one night stay. The majority of patients now that are straightforward for mastectomy are done in a day case unless they need the extra support because all of the pre-work and all of the support is there before surgery and the support is there after surgery. They can phone their breast care nurse whenever they want. So whereas before they had five days, they're now down to day case or one day. 
So as part of that, all the discharge checklists were done, the standard operating procedures, and changes were introduced over a pilot period as part of the NHS improvement project from all the staff within the patient journey. As with most things, we did a plan, do, check, act, see what went wrong, see what needs tweaking. And then we spoke at our network group to other hospitals within the area to see if they were interested. And they were. Some were reluctant, but they did try. So over the years, we've produced all the checklists. We've got protocols for the seromas and the drains, which the senior nurses on the ward that are suitable for doing nurse their discharge follow. And we've also got criteria for early discharge. And the, the discharge checklist and the criteria have to be completed for every patient prior to the patient being discharged. Otherwise, the consultants have a field day and start trying to get all the power back. <laughs> How is this improvement sustained? What we did was uh, Kelly started it all with this, this first trust. Um, um, at the start we went to all the project groups and then we gradually left them the reins and left them a bit more and then I took over from her and what we then decided to do was rather than holding hands all the time was let them walk and run by themselves uh, so we just did an annual data review if anything spiked then we'd go back in and review it and what helped sustain it for the initial trust is because there was really City Hospital and King's College that were at the forefront of the breast one night stay model, the outward facing side of it kept the drive and the clinicians. They couldn't be seen as one of these forerunners to let it all slip. So that helped. Um, and the move to the treatment centre, we had a treatment centre that opened earlier on in the time uh, that had a 23 hour stay unit, which meant that all the staff in there were geared up to short and stay. So this is just some examples of our pilot trust. So at the start, we'd have one day stay. And the, it's a bit bad, sorry. The blue is early days. The red is in 2009. And the yellow is further. So what we can actually see is in the early days, we had a, most patients were going home on one day stay. Now, there seems to be an even split between zero day day case and a one night stay. And it all depends. Each patient is treated as an individual and assessed at pre-op to make sure that they are on the right stay. When we rolled out across the network, we then reviewed everybody. And that's an example of what we took back each year to our breast network group um, so that we could discuss the findings and speak to the clinicians and the breast CNSs that attended the group and say, do you need help? Do you want us to come back in and re-audit something? In 2009, the national team, as part of NHS improvements, decided to re-look at all the data and looked across the whole of the network. And what we saw then was three hot spots that needed a little tweaking. Um, so we went back into them. One of them was completely down to they'd had a change in clinical lead. So we had to start <coughs> back from scratch again, start all the work, um, and try and convince him the reasons behind the work. And one was they merged with a gynae ward. So there was four beds originally for the breast service, but there was more, more patients than the four beds. And we really had to look at going right back into the, the bowels of the project um, and all the, all the problems <coughs> that that took on. And now they've picked up. So now the majority of patients are at the one day. So with the review at QE, which is one of the trusts, we reconvened a project group. I've just spent a year back there. Uh, we redid the complete map, in, uh, the current state map. We've read on the patient surveys, and what we actually found was one patient said, oh, I did this service on the first time round, like 12 months ago. And the service is so much better after we've just done all these changes, which was really quite good to actually hear, because we don't like to see a patient come back through the service again. Um, but it is warming to hear that they've seen an improvement. And we created a new action plan. This time, 
we left them to really get on with it, with just uh, me attending the project boards and offering assistance. So in 2010 and 11, they had 78% of patients with a one-day stay or less, and in September last year, they had 100%, and it's still keeping going now. Ranges each month between 95 and 100% of patients that have a one-day stay or less. Reviewing one of the other trusts, we went, went over the mapping again. This time, they weren't on nurse discharge, but the consultants were halfway there. So one consultant decided he wasn't going to use drains anymore, so patients, he was quite happy for the nurses to discharge the patient if they followed all of the pathway. And the other consultant who still wanted to use drains said, but you can take them out without asking me on this day if it's such and such, so you don't have to wait and see me. So we're getting there, small little steps. As I mentioned, the thing that's helped sustain it is by keeping it, keep publishing. The consultants like to be at the forefront, they like to lead the way. And so over the years, we've been involved with the winning principles, not just the pilot trust, some of the other trusts have now started to go in. So we're in three of the four winning pr principles, um, and then the fourth trust then accepted their own one in some of the latest papers in 2009. And we've written uh, case studies. So although there's been two service improvement facilitators, the drivers in across the whole network have been the consultant lead and one of the CNSs that have really driven the project. And over the years, we've done the patient groups, we've done the focus groups, and we've done the patient surveys, and the breast CNSs have been superb, and they've come out. The patients have actually said it's having a point of contact that's a nurse so speaks more their language and is more approachable, they said, um, that has really made the difference. Because they know that they can phone that nurse at any time and she'll say, it's okay, we're fine. If you want to come and see me, come in at the end of the clinic and I'll come and see you. This is just an example of the, the national pathway that was introduced. So it's very wordy. But what we actually do now is every now and again we'll visit, revisit the teams and say, okay, this is the best practice pathway. Can you highlight which bits you're not doing, which bits you are doing, and which bits you're still working towards? And it just means we've got a rag matrix then to say which areas do we need to help work on. So the quality outcomes, reduction in readmissions, because we weren't getting all the seromas from the drains, um, then patients won't get any infections into the seromas. So there was less readmissions, there was less reoperations, um, which meant the patients were happier. Um, reduction in reoperations, as I said, reduction in complications. With the wounds, a lot of the times, the more you mess with it, the more infection gets in. And the more the cosmetic view I mean, it's a, it's a personal thing for the lady, and it does mean a lot. And then some of them don't go on to have reconstruction. So how the scar puckers means a lot to them. We set the patient's expectations from day one, so they know what to expect. And that's been one of the key wins in the project. The patient knows what to expect. They can own their own journey. We've reduced the risk of hospital infections, reduced... Um, all the interventions that are needed, we don't need the outreach team to go in, the patient can be their own person again, <coughs> and we've reduced all the analgesic side effects. I don't like costs, I hate costs, uh, mainly because I'm no good at them. So what we looked at, for in our area, the tariff has between 200 and 250 pounds bed day for a typical basic B&B. And we looked at, with the average length of stay reducing from 5.3 down to 1, we didn't include all the day case ones, how much it could actually reduce. Unfortunately, the worst bit is, is none of this actually goes back into the service. It gets eaten up by the hospital, so that's the worst bit. Um, so it's a theoretical savings. Apparently, according to the National NHS Improvement, the traditional breast inpatient pathway used to cost 19 million a year. The new model is eight and a half million a year. 
So across the whole country it saves. And that means it can be spent on new nurses. It can be spent on new equipment. Types of savings theoretically have been uh, release bed day capacity, reductions in length of stay, day care surgery admissions, reductions in unnecessary outpatient attendance due to the ceramas, and reduction in the use of wound drains and lower hospital costs. So the key message is that we've then spread not only within the breast world, um, but onto one of my colleagues is looking at breast reconstruction at the pilot hospital um, to reduce their length of stay. And a lot of my colleagues are also working in enhanced recovery. So we've also shared all the learning across them into the other areas. And the main things have been patient experience, patient expectations and patient safety come first, and the correct utilisation of staff. Standard in, standardised information, uh, care plans and analgesia have also been all involved in the future work in other areas. So in um, the quality and productivity case study, which I've got pinned on the board if anybody wants to have a look, um, they've said that Sam and West Birmingham Hospitals, NHS Trust, now provide 94% of all breast surgeries within one day. And they've looked at all the evidence, all the sustainability and all of the outcomes. Thank you. Any you um, mentioned that one of the red spots that, that popped up was actually due to a new manager. Uh, what uh, measures has the organisation ta taken to, um, well, whenever, whenever a new member joins the team, do they get a, a training <coughs> and follow up to speed on the new measures? To avoid that type thing. Yeah, unfortunately, they did do that. Unfortunately, it was a new clinical lead for the service. So if it had been a normal, say normal consultant, a consultant joining the team, then they would have been into that way. But when it was a new clinical lead taking over, then it was having to dig out all the evidence, see what evidence he believes in and likes to look at and revisit in all the audits. But now the breast care nurses in that trust are very good at nagging. I, um, I'm a patient experience manager. One of the things you mentioned which interests me is you ask about the patient experience at the point of admission and then at the point of discharge. I just wonder what does that give you? Do, do you learn anything from doing that? Because I've not heard anybody else do anything like that. We do it more so. We do it, um, our audits, we do it at the start of a project before we make any changes. And then afterwards, um, after all the changes have, have gone through, as part of our plan, do, check, act cycle, uh, because a lot of the times the nurses and the consultants can say, it's all going fine, and the patients will pick up that a couple of days it was freezing on the ward and we need to provide an extra blanket or things like that. Um, so it's actually, we find doing it, most of our surveys are now done post-discharge, so the patient's with all their information and their suitcase full of information they go home with, in there hidden somewhere is a questionnaire that they send back anonymously. Uh, we did try doing it um, while they were sat in the hospital waiting for their discharge. So the first time round, it was while they were waiting for however many hours it took for the discharge to go through. Um, but we found that we got a better picture after when they filled it in a week later, once they were settled in in their own home comforts, and starting to feel human again. So yeah, just another comment, just excellent stuff again, just thinking about the quality for the patient, you know, thinking about the patient experience, mm -hmm. and I know you don't like numbers, but the numbers drop out the other end, don't they? You know, if you get things right first time, all those benefits. So, yeah, it's quite relevant at this moment in time, but focusing on quality, you can still get your efficiency improvements coming. Yeah, so excellent stuff.